welcome to Authors Without Borders Presents. I'm your host today, Alberta Sequera, and I'm a little excited to say that Authors Without Borders finally finished our first year with the NBTV 95, and I'm hoping we have a lot of followers by now, and this is going to be the first session for what we call the beginning of our next year. And I have the privilege of uh, introducing and interviewing author Tom Serenato. I hope I said your name right, Tom. And um, so the, Tom started out with very interesting ever in both of his books. Uh, the first one is The Constant Outsider, and we'll get into it a little bit deeper what the book's about. But what's even more fascinating, after he wrote the book, he decided to say, now what if, what if I really went uh, the other way in my story with the mob? And he wrote, the 67 cents, which is fictional, but yet you can relate to the story. So Tom, before we get into the actual books, can you tell us a little bit about your years growing up with your family? Do you have siblings? Did anybody else want to write in the family? No, I don't think anybody's written in my family, although I, I think some of them could have. My brother led a very interesting life, uh, working yeah. for NASA and the uh, space program and things like that. So. Yeah. I'm surprised he didn't write something about that. Yeah, after you became a writer, you'd think that that mm. would have gave him an idea. You have to put that little bug in his ear. It's, yeah, it's too late now. It's, <laughs> you think so? Well, yeah. Oh, passed away. Um, well, let's talk about your first book, The Constant Outsider. Mm -hmm. what, um, what made you become a writer, first of all? Was it because of this story you had behind your mind, or did you just want to write? I never had it in my mind, actually. It's, I didn't realize how unique my upbringing and my, my younger life was until other people brought it to my attention because you know how you tell stories about things that have happened in your past and mm -hmm. basically none of them had incidents where people put guns to their heads and things like that. Yeah. And I thought that was just a normal way of living because you know in South Boston things like, like that happen quite often. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, when I would tell those stories my friends would say, you know, you ought to write a book because things like that don't happen to average people. Yeah. And then I realized I had gotten to know a lot of very interesting characters and also lived through history in the making. Mm -hmm. So basically it's the history that uh, behind those times that I write about that uh, inspired me to write. Mm -hmm. It wasn't anything special about me, it's where I was and the time I was there. Mm -hmm. But um, you talked a lot about your scene was at your um you owned a gas station. Yeah. Uh -huh. Can you tell us a little bit about the activities? Which, cause to me, that was the main point of your whole story where yeah. everything yeah. happened. Well, gas, station, gas stations are an interesting place in the first place. But if you put one in the heart of South Boston, where there's bookies, there's loan sharks, there's killers, there's basically, and there are a lot of nice people too. And um, they all have to have their cars fixed and they all congregate around gas stations when they find one that they like. So I got to know a lot of those types of people. And that's why uh, <laughs> some of the things in the book, I mean, I, I read them and I can't even believe they happened myself. Well, you got involved with the mob. Yeah. With Whitey oh. Bolger. Well, well, they used, uh, I had a payphone in my office there. And they would often use those to make their, their calls, you know, and you know, I would be privy to those conversations. Um, they approached me to store hijacked trucks at times and uh, actually asked me if I would hold high stakes poker games in my back room for the heavy hitters of the mob, you know, because mm. uh, I guess that's how they held their uh, strategic meetings over card games and things. Mm -hmm. And of course in real life I said no to those, to those offers. And they would have been lucrative. They offered me 10% of every pot that uh, mm -hmm. was gambled during those high stakes games. And I was assured that there'd be no trouble at the games and things like that. Were you tempted? No, I no? wasn't. Well, you know, it's nice to be in with those guys, but once you start playing ball with them, it's really they hard to you. stop, you know, because then, like you say, they own you. So. And one thing that always held me back from doing that was I always kept in the back of my mind, my father was always on the up and up. He always kept a legitimate shop. He, he was very honest with the customers. He knew all the mob guys, but never played ball with them and never 
uh, allowed them to utilize the shop. So I lived by those same rules. That's the way I was brought up, and I, I would have, it would have killed my family if I went the other way, and then all at once they watch on the news, oh, there's a chop shop being operated mm. in South Boston where stolen cars are being uh, stripped. That's the other thing. They got me involved in without me even knowing it. They started bringing cars in from out of state and asking me to do questionable work on them, like removing stereos, tires, putting ball yeah. tires on. And it, uh, it took me quite a bit of finagling to get out of that situation. You know, it's surprising because when you hear of people that try to not get involved with those, they mm -hmm. even have the control so much as really causing death in the family yeah. because if you don't fall. So you're very lucky that something like that didn't happen. I was very lucky. In yeah. fact, they wanted, con they wanted access to my shop so bad that at one time when they heard I was having trouble with a certain individual, <clears throat> I had a mob guy come up to me and say, Tom, give me 67 cents. So I'm giving away something, but that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. all right. <laughs> and that's the title of my second book, you know, 67 cents. He said, give me 67 cents. I said, what do you want 67 cents for? He says, you buy the bullet and so-and-so is history. In other words, yeah. all I had to do was say, go ahead and pay for the bullet and they would have killed somebody for me. I mean, but mm. again, in real life, I said no to that. Yeah. But in the second book, I often wondered what life, what path my life would have taken if I had taken advantage of all those, all those opportunities. First of all, I would have made a lot of money if I ran the high stakes card games in the shop. They would have paid a premium to, to store a hijacked truck in the shop. And if they had killed somebody for me, how would my life have changed? So I was free to explore that path in uh, the second book. And it gets very, very interesting. It does. Now, you had a chance, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I know I read your book, but you had a chance where Whitey Bulger actually came into your gas station. Can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that? I know yeah. it couldn't have been a long time, but... You know. Well, on the east side of Southie, I got to know a lot of the Italian mobsters, mostly. I believe that they controlled the eastern part of South Boston from Broadway to the to the waterfront. And the Irish mob kind of kept to itself on the west side. And that's where Whitey's bars were, you know, the uh, triple O's where he hung around, his, his, his uh, base of operations. And so I never really got to see Whitey Bulger mm. until one day during the gas shortage in 1970-something, this stranger comes in for gas and we had a sign up that said, you know, $2 limit on fuel because I had to save enough gas to, to fuel my commercial customers cars. Mm. They depended on us and uh, so we would limit strangers to just a couple of bucks worth of gas. Mm. So this car pulled in, I had the sign up and he says, fill it up. And I look at the guy and say, hey, you know, I started arguing with him because it's obvious we're not filling cars up and I had had a, a hard day already so I got a little short tempered with him and uh, I says, can't you read the sign? You know, <laughs> you know you're talking I didn't too. know what I was talking to. <laughs> and, uh, I says, two dollar limit. He, he pulled out a gun and he stuck it out the window at me. He says, I said, fill it up, right? So I had had some run-ins previously and, and there had been an incident where a guy got shot at the gas pumps on the other end of town, killed. Mm. So I had an armed guard in my office. The very first day my friend was in there guarding me with his gun, this happened. Mm. So I nodded, okay, I'll fill you up and I walked away to the pumps. Now the guy is leaning out the window, he's got the gun like close to his chest like this, and he's watching me as I'm ready to gas up his car. And I nod towards my office, giving him the signal that I'm having a problem. He already knew that because he saw the gun. So as soon as I got out of the field of fire, my guy whips the door open, he puts his gun out right at Whitey Bulger's head like this. He's only 10 feet away from the front door of the, of the office. Of course, we didn't know who it was. And he was very good at keeping his face out of the media. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until maybe two or three years later, believe it or not, that a mugshot of Whitey started being uh, circulated. Mm -hmm. And I looked at that and my, my face got tingly, chilled, because I realized, oh my God, that's the guy who came in and tried <laughs> to get gas at gunpoint. And my friend saved me. He drove away that day so fast 
that he barely was able to get his head back in the window. The electric window caught his hat in the window and crushed it. And uh, my friend and I are laughing. Did you see that guy take off like that? And uh, we were really laughing about it. And we never even called the cops about it. Yeah. In those days in Southie, nobody called the cops. That seemed like a normal thing then. It was just day to day. We saw guns all the time. You yeah. know? Now, how did you feel when you heard that Whitey was captured? Oh, and was he was arrested. How did you feel hearing that news and at the same time knowing, I know you didn't write a lot about him, but no. you did write a, quite a bit about the mob. Yeah. I mean, did you, what were your feelings with that? I was glad that he got captured, actually, but yeah. I, I didn't think I'd live long enough to see that happen. Because 16 years, he was able to live a quiet life. We all thought he was in, um, you know, Europe somewhere with a safety deposit box everywhere with all the cash that he had stashed all around the world, which he did. Mm. Um, nobody expected to find him here in the United States. Yeah. So it's going to be very, very interesting when that trial starts because I heard that he wants to testify mm. in person at that trial and he's got a few bombshells to drop. Mm. So well, I hope a lot of people listening um, have the interest in reading that book because it's true to life back mm -hmm. in your days uh, mm -hmm. with the mob and that's just one location so you can imagine right. what actually happened with oh, people that did get involved and they controlled their businesses. Yeah. In fact I did know some people that got involved. I, I only recently found out that the person that actually introduced Whitey Bulger to the cocaine trade was a friend of mine that ran another automobile shop. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I knew he was involved in cocaine only, I thought, recreationally. I didn't realize that he was distributing. Uh, people were pretty good about keeping, keeping uh, those types of activities uh, quiet. How did your friends feel when they know you wrote about those days? I haven't spoken. You know, basically, just about every one of them that I have tried to contact since those days is dead. You know, they've either disappeared, I have nobody knows where they are, or, or they did die. You know, some of them, during when I knew them, were shot to death. Mm. And because they didn't play ball the right way. Mm. Now, so. talking about, you know, after reading your book, I wonder how you're even sitting here and you're alive today because you did some crazy things in that <laughs> book. I mean, <laughs> seriously, uh, if you could give us some ideas of some of the things so that people will understand what I'm talking about. Oh. Uh, <laughs> health-wise, the chances you took in life? Well, I've always liked to try different things. So, you know, I went out and became a certified scuba diver. And also, on Evening Magazine back in the 1970s, I saw this ultralight being demonstrated on TV. And I immediately when I saw that, I said, oh my god, I gotta have one of those. <laughs> so, I did. I went out and bought an ultralight aircraft, uh, which I you know, I, I took it up several times, but never really got to be what you'd call proficient at it. Yeah. <laughs> and ended up crashing that in the ocean, and it sank upside down, and went, <laughs> and I was strapped in with shoulder harnesses, helmet, uh, seat belt, hanging upside down, you know, 12, 15 feet of water, ice cold, yeah. and had to get out of that contraption and swim to the surface. That was one thing. I totaled several vehicles, taken down telephone poles being stupid and you know about those instance, yeah. instances so I was able to survive those things too and not that I'm bragging about them mm. I, I'm very embarrassed yeah. about some of the things I did because they didn't show very good judgment yeah but I did I figured if I didn't include all that stuff in the book I wasn't gonna be writing well, that's an true. Honest book. Yeah. Like, like you have to tell people just bad judgment that you've had. If yeah. you're going to write a memoir, you can't just put the good stuff in. Yeah. You have to put everything. Now, with uh, 67 cents, it's interesting. Like you said that you did the other side of it. Mm -hmm. um, you had to have some fun doing it, realizing mm -hmm. what could have happened. But is there an actual message that you're trying to get out to people writing that 67 cents right after the constant outsider? Yeah, and I think that message will become very clear. If somebody doesn't know me, I'm actually hoping they read the second book first, uh, 67 cents first, because that might make them want to know how real life went. But you'll see a very close correlation between the two books, the incidents that are in the book, because I, I incorporated a lot of real life situations into the fictional version, 
but with one minor change of choice, how your life can take a totally different path the wrong, is, but is the message that the wrong I'm trying to get through to kids. That, And it's not really a kid's book. There's a lot of swearing and there's a lot yeah. of violence in the book, but that's the way these guys spoke in those days, and uh, <clears throat> you can't sugarcoat it. But basically, yeah. the, the message is be careful of the choices that you make because if, if you say yes to the wrong thing, it leads to another thing and another thing and another thing. And in this book, it leads the main character, which is my fictional, hmm. uh, what, what do they call it? When the uh, your your opposite yeah. uh, person that you would that you are. Yeah. It leads him to actually be involved in murder. Yeah. And it's so true to life. People think sometimes they read this that it's just a, a story, but people that are living this life know that it can be reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it could very well have ended up being my reality. I tried to write this book as if this really could have happened. This would have been the next step if I had done this, that, and the other thing. So. Now, and after these two books, do you have a, a feeling of wanting writing something else? <laughs> I know myself, I never wanted to write, and I'm working on my, like my fifth book, and you say, oh my God, for someone who didn't want to write. But I think that's what all writers feel. Mm -hmm. After a while, you're like lost it once your story ends. Do you feel that way? I, I never had it in my mind to write anything in the first place, yet alone something, something more than what I've already written. But it's other people that keep asking me, you know, Tom, you're going to write another book? We want to see where this goes. And, you know, I have some ideas. Yeah. But no, I hadn't thought about it until people, again, suggested it. And I had the funniest suggestion the other day. Somebody asked me, Tom, you should write a children's book. That's <laughs> a big change. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if they read this second book and they... This thing of children's book. <laughs> yeah, they would uh, probably reconsider that suggestion. <laughs> Now, how are your books doing with, um, just for people that are listening, especially if they're into writing, we all know that the writing is the fun part. Mm -hmm. Now we didn't get into the promoting and marketing. Mm -hmm. And it's sad as an author how our books, uh, paperbacks, seem to be overrun by the e-books. Mm. Do you find that with yours? Or? I don't think it's sad at all. No? It's such a beautiful thing, this this uh, Kindle and all, all the different uh, variations of that online uh, book reading because basically if you have a good story to put out there anybody can you know with a little bit of skill get get their books on the internet and let the market judge whether it's a good work or not mm. because people will buy it and they'll one person reads it and then they tell another person and then they it's so easy to you get it, you know, that way, yeah. electronically. And that's the, that's the wave of the future. It was just a thing on, uh, on TV last night about that, saying that so many people that were born in the 70s, 80s, and 90s are basically exclusively using uh, e-books now. Mm. I don't think it's a, a bad thing at all for authors because basically you make a lot more money on an e-book than you do on a print book where you might get a dollar or two out of the book sale. Yeah. Um, it's funny you mentioned the price like that, a dollar out of the book, because I, I'm sure people meet an author and they go, wow, these people are rich. Yeah, <laughs> they right. only know right. how you're really struggling to get mm. the sales out. Unless you're very fortunate and you're in the right place at the right time and meet the right person. Exactly. They can yeah. help um, yeah. And you know fame, yourself. I guess you would call it, of getting known. Other you know than yourself. That. You can try, try, and oh. you, you, you do a lot of uh, functions and things. I'm not able to do all that stuff because I have a really bad back, so I can't really sit through a lot of So you must have things. some injuries from the kind of life you read that you, yeah. I mean, that you wrote about in The Constant Outside. Well, I did break my back when I was like eight years old doing a, a stupid stunt at school, and that never got fixed. And then I ended up with scoliosis and... Uh, a steel Milwaukee brace for a year in high school and that didn't stop the curvature so I had to have spinal fusion and a Harrington rod put in when I was 25 or 26 wow. and that was six months in a plastic bo plaster body cast so <laughs> yeah I, I think it's I have x-rays at home I have stacks of full-body x-rays this thick Alberta yeah it's amazing 
that I'm still here with the radiation I've been exposed now, to. Now, you had a motorcycle that you loved. Yeah. You used to hop on it every yeah. year, was it? You went out west to visit a friend, and yeah. you had to <clears throat> sell that also. Yeah, I couldn't, couldn't ride it anymore because of the back problem. So basically, I'm hoping the books sell themselves because I'm not able to get out there and do the promotion like, like an author should. Yeah. And that's the really hard work, you know. Well, you've been doing pretty good with the e-books, and that's nice mm. for an author because you really don't have to go anywhere and having those things sell. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Now, <clears throat> you also had problems with getting the confidence to talk to the public. Yeah. But mm -hmm. you've been going to um, an organization. Mm -hmm. um, Toastmaster. Toastmaster, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, have they helped you a lot with speaking? They have, yeah. And I would say anybody that has a problem speaking in public, which most people do, they say they people fear that more than death. Yeah. And I can see how that's true. <laughs> but like some something like today, yeah. you have to be willing to at least get out and talk about talk your about work. Yeah. Or maybe you're in a corporate uh, mm. lifestyle or where, setting where you have to do speeches in front of board members, things like that. Yeah. If you're not able to speak to people, it's very difficult to get yeah. your message out. So. Yeah, Toastmasters has been a very big help yeah. to me. Now, where can people um, buy your two books? They can get them on Amazon.com in hard copy. They can get it on the Kindle, of course, which you can read on your computer. They have the apps for mm -hmm. all that. Um, Barnes & Noble, any of the major bookstores, you can get them. You can order them there if they don't mm -hmm. have them on the shelf. They can go to my website, theconstantoutsider.com, mm -hmm. and get a signed copy uh, if they want me to write a personal note to somebody they want to gift a book to. Basically, everybody has a connection to South Boston somehow. Yeah. So I've gotten a lot of people from Alaska, California, and they'll, they'll email me and they say, can you write to my mother? She was born in South Boston. Yeah. You know, put yeah. a little note in there, and I'm happy but to do that. But that's exciting. Yeah. Yes, it is, because you're trying to reach the reader. Yeah. Now, you have a couple of appearances that are coming up. Could you tell us about yeah, those Yeah, one's two? a private appearance at a, a retired veterans, a uh, retired government worker uh, function. But there is one public event coming up November 2nd, and that's the Dyer Literary uh, Series. It's in Cambridge, located at Out of the Blue Art Gallery. 106 Prospect Street, Street in Cambridge, and that's going at, starting at 8 p.m. And basically, they have two or three authors that they invite to come in and do a reading mm. from their books. And then there's some open mic time for other people that might want mm. to see if they can get in there and talk about their works. Mm. So maybe you'll accompany me. That yeah, night. I don't know if I, I just might do that. Yeah. <clears throat> now, anybody who's watching, I hope you get the chance to go to Tom's events. Uh, we have just a few more minutes left. So, Tom, I thank you for coming. Oh, thank it's you so much for inviting you. me. It's a privilege having you. And what I'd like to do is just give a few events that are going on with Authors Without Borders because we, too, would mm -hmm. love you to stop by and introduce yourself and let us have a chance to talk to you. And we also do workshops. Uh, we have that all listed on Authors Without Borders, which is uh, www.awb6 dot com the number six so what we have coming up the 25th uh, myself personally I have a three-hour workshop for writers and it's at the Upper Cape Cod Tech in Bonn and if you give them a call it's the adult educational department uh, they'll be able to help you out and I hope to see somebody there uh, September 29th we go to the Lakeville um, Arts Festival, and Tom, sometimes you go there, and I'm not sure if you're going to be there this year, but I'm sure you'll be walking around oh, there. I will. It's not raining. <laughs> <laughs> October 6th and 7th, um, the other authors will also be announcing these when their turns come up per month, but the 6th and 7th, everybody knows about the Cranberry uh, Harvest Festival, mm -hmm. and we have a great time there. We're under the tent. Come and visit us. Uh, we have our books, and sometimes we give out free articles. So I hope to see everybody there, and I want to thank you very much for tuning in. And next month, we'll have another host from uh, Authors Without Borders. With I, We'll have some surprises. I won't say who they are. So <laughs> please turn in, tune in, and thank you for stopping by. Thank you.